Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started since it's six after. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us on a Saturday morning. My name is Katie Flores and I'll be moderating today. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to put those in the chat or in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, before we do officially get started, we like to ask everyone how um, you found out about today's webinar. So I'm just gonna pop a poll question on your screen if you don't mind answering that for us. How did you hear about today's webinar? So the emails are working and the staff uh, at Senior Source has been sharing. So that's great. Um, and now I would like to introduce Kimberly Knight. She is the director of the Caregiver Support Program at the Senior Source. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Katie said, my name is Kimberly Knight. I'm the director of caregiver support at the Senior Source. And before we get into today's presentation, I wanna share a little bit with you about our programs and services through the caregiver support program that we offer. Um, caregiver support is a program that is just that we're here to support the caregiver. And our main goal is to provide resources and support to individuals and families so that they feel confident in their role as a caregiver. You know, one thing about the caregiving experience is that it is not often planned. Um, something happens to someone we love and we just kind of have to rush in and be there to support them the best way that we can. And we're not always prepared to do that as caregivers. And so um, the caregiver support program is here to be a guiding light for you in that way and provide you with information and resources. Also, we're here to provide caregivers with um, what we say the oxygen mask, right? To help remind them to take care of themselves and to focus on their own mental, physical, and emotional well being. Um, because caregiving can have an emotional toll on us. If you are a caregiver, and I'm, I'm assuming that if you're here today with us, you are, you know exactly how stressful and overwhelming um, the day to day can get. And so um, we're here to help, you know. Um, take a level of stress off of you and at least point you to resources and community that can be helpful um, to your mental and emotional well-being. In addition to the services that we offer, um, I just wanna go through them outside of the information and resources and support for assistance. We also offer care consultations with individuals and families, support groups for caregivers, caregiver education and seminars like you're participating in today and free incontinence supplies. Um, these are just some of the services that we offer. And I'm gonna share with you a little bit more about what a care consultation is a little later in the presentation. But just for sake of um, asking, how many of you guys that are with us today are um, family caregivers or professional caregivers, or in my situation, you could actually be both. And we're gonna put another poll on the screen for you to answer. All right. All right. So your professional caregiver, thank you so much for answering that question for us. So for many of our services that they're geared towards family caregivers. And another way of say, saying family caregivers is informal caregivers, which basically means that they're an unpaid individual that are taking on some, on some of the activities of daily living and medical tasks for the care recipient. That person could be their family member, they could be a friend, they could be a neighbor or a member of their religious community. A formal caregiver is another way of saying a paid caregiver. This is someone who's professionally trained that may be coming into the home or providing services in a care setting. They can be in a daycare, a residential community, a long-term care facility, or they could be a social worker that's working with that individual, helping to connect them to services in the community. All right, so one of the main questions we get asked in caregiver support is, how do I know as a family caregiver, how do I know when it's time for me to step in and help my loved one? Well, the main way you know how to step in or when it's time, it's based on their activities of daily living or the instrumental activities of daily living. These are the indicators that let us know when it is time to 
um, step in for the first time or increase our care. So for example, if you're over to your parents' home and you're just noticing them, you know, walk through the home, you'll start to see changes over time. As they're navigating their home, at first, they're able to do it independently. You could see them operate in the kitchen. They know where everything is. They're able to access pots, pans, dishes very easily. As time goes on, as they increase in age, you may notice that they have more problems with these types of tasks. They may have problems getting up out of their chair. Um, they may start to hold on to piece of pieces of furniture to navigate through the home or a wall. That's an indicator for you as a caregiver that your loved one may need an assistive device like a cane or a rollator at this point to help them navigate through the home. Um, also too, they may um, start to forget that they're cooking. They may put the dishes in on the stove or in the oven and, and they burn them because they just simply forgot um, that they were even in that task. Those are the signs and warning signs, I would say, that as caregivers, those are times where we need to start to step in and assist our loved one, whether we are um, assisting them personally or we hire a home, um, home health company or home care to come in and assist. These are the indicators that our loved one need more of our help and attention in these areas of their day-to-day -day living. Also to assistive devices, such as hearing and vision, um, changes in eyesight can be a factor. Um, also needing hearing aids. And also the biggest thing, you know, the, the number one way our loved ones hurt themselves or even lead to death or falls in the home. So, you know, these are the things where we go into the home and we look, we want to do something called safe proof in the home to keep our loved ones safe from falling, hitting their heads and um, having something detrimental happen to them. Now, one of the main things we do at caregiver support, and I would say it's probably um, very, very instrumental to a new caregiver or a caregiver who's been doing this for a while and they're stuck and not sure what to do is a care consultation. That is where you can sit down with us. You can make an appointment. We can talk to you one-on-one -on -one about your loved one's needs, your financial situation, and we can provide you with referrals and just information tailored more to your situation uh, with a specific focus on you as a caregiver and your special needs. Um, Last year, we assisted over 1,800 people and 81% of them clients reported less caregiver-related stress after attending a care consultation. Um, also in caregiver support, 65% um, of those that we are serving as our caregivers are taking care of a loved one with dementia. Um, dementia is something that is very prevalent in our community. And we are here at the Senior Source is another resource outside of the Alzheimer's Association that's here in Dallas that can be of assistance to you if you're taking care of someone with dementia. Through our caregiver support program, uh, we offer support groups. They meet every third Tuesday of the month, third Wednesday of the month. Um, and we have English language and Spanish language support groups. And we also launched a new LGBTQ plus support group um, for caregivers and a grief support group. Um, that group meets every third Tuesday of the month as well. So we look forward to having you in those um, support groups. And if you've never been to a support group, I encourage you to try it out because um, it is a great way for you to not only meet new people, um, have social interaction, but it's a great way to kind of just vent and also get good information from people who are also walking along the same path that you are. And they always have excellent tips of uh, what can work for you. So I encourage you to join. Last but not least, we have a caregiver focus, which is our monthly newsletter. It gives you nice tips and tools as a caregiver to help you remember to focus on yourself and um, just nutritional tips and just ways to, like I said, care for yourself. We also have our listing of all of our education classes that are coming up for that month and our caregiver focus, as well as our upcoming support groups. And this is a caregiver support team. These are all the ladies at the Senior Source that make it happen and um, our phone number. So if you have any questions or concerns, you want to reach out to us, you can call us directly at 214-823-5700, or you can email us at csp at the seniorsource.org. We're always here to answer your questions, and we look forward to um, helping you with your caregiving needs. Are there any questions? All right, no questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Katie and we'll get started with Cindy. Thank you, Kimberly. 
All right, now I would like to introduce our presenter today, Cindy Kleckner. She's an award-winning registered dietitian, nutritionist, culinary expert, and author. Cindy works with numerous companies and organizations as a health educator, recipe developer, and national speaker at conferences, consumer events, and corporate wellness programs. So let's get cooking, Cindy. Hey, Katie, thank you so much. And welcome everyone on a gloomy Saturday morning. Um, I'm looking forward to, you know, sharing a, an hour with you and giving you some practical tips and meal solutions on how to help you with your nutrition needs. You know, thinking about January, um, you know, Kimberly and I came up with the thought that we needed to do something a uh, theme that really had to do with how can we stretch our food dollars? So we came up with dining on a dime, which is is almost a little bit of a joke these days. You know, with budget stretch from the holidays and also the rising cost of food, you know, it can really be a hard time for a lot of people, but it's also the perfect time to focus on smart and healthy, budget-friendly cooking and also shopping, shopping and cooking. It's a great way um, a great way to save um, in your shopping is really to get yourself back in the kitchen because so many people when they're you know busy with caregiving it's so much easier to just call in food or bring in food or have it delivered or go out and uh, it can really um, you know eat up your your budget so fast uh, today we're going to talk about a lot of money saving tips at the grocery store and how to stretch that food dollar and also strategies on how to eat healthy on a budget. So that's our focus today. So we're gonna get started with um, five different recipes. And uh, the first one we're gonna do is start off with our dessert, just like people who work in the caves, you know, they always eat dessert first, just in case the cave caves in. But uh, I wanted to start with dessert only because I'm going to pop it in the oven and then we'll display it uh, for everybody to see what it looks like at the end after it bakes. Um, this first recipe is called angel cake, pineapple angel cake, two ingredients. Um, and today we're going to focus a lot on foods that you can purchase inexpensively at, you know, big box stores. Um, you know, cost saving stores. And that's really one of the names of the game when we're talking about healthy eating. You want to focus on where can I get, you know, good quality food. And many times it's really just focusing on getting canned goods, frozen goods. And a lot of people have this mis misinformation that if it's not fresh, and fresh, uh, you know, from the grocery store that it's not good quality. And it really is. In fact, I like to call myself as a dietitian an equal opportunity produce pusher. And that means that not only do I, you know, purchase and use fresh fruits and vegetables, but I also get canned and frozen and dried and also juice when it, when it uh, you know, fits my, uh, fits my needs. So it's really important to think about all those different things. And many times those particular products are going to save you a lot of money. And also, if your day or your week gets away from you and you buy a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, what ends up happening, it goes to waste because it ends up in the, the veggie bin and it, um, it spoils. So when you have um, a lot of canned goods and also some frozen foods, you know, you can keep it a lot longer and use it when you need it. So the number one thing that I always say in these demos is planning. Planning is so crucial to healthy eating. Failing to plan is planning to fail when it comes to either shopping or cooking healthy. So it's really important before you go to the grocery store, make a sketch out a little list of things that you want to eat for the week, things that you might need. And that entails also, um, you know, kind of getting a, a pantry built, build a pantry so that you can have a lot of these staples on hand so that when it comes to the noon hour or the six o'clock scramble, you can open up the pantry and just kind of make a lot of different things from the staples that you normally, you know, have on hand. That is really, really critical. So planning is the key. Even myself, if I don't sketch out what I'm going to eat, 
for the week. I'll go to the store and come back and, and miss half the ingredients. So it's really important to plan. Another reason you plan is when you get all the food that you need, you're not running to the store a lot, which saves time. And it also saves money. And it also kind of gives you a good opportunity to um, kind of be excited about what you're going to be eating for the next couple of meals because you have it all planned out. And it doesn't have to be a, a you know, a real uh, organized kind of a fat, um, board or, um, you know, kind of a approach to do it. It can be something is just sketching it out on a little piece of paper. So don't be overwhelmed by that. But, you know, get back to the planning is really, really important. So when you go shopping, it's so critical to have a list. You know, I have a list already made out that I never have to recreate. I just make copies of it. And when I run out of something that is in my staples, whether it's in the freezer or in the pantry, I just take out my list, everything that I typically would use, I circle. So I have a, a designated shopping list on my counter. So if I run out of something, I just circle. I don't have to go to the paper or pen and kind of try to remember everything that I would normally use. In my pantry, I might have, uh, you know, several cans of uh, tomato, chopped tomatoes, tomato sauce, tomato paste, multiple kinds of beans, different kinds of pasta. So, you know, jarred spaghetti sauce, all different things. And some of them we're using today in our recipes. So when you're that organized, you can, you know, make it happen no matter what time of day it is. And, and having those frozen goods and those canned goods and those staples that you normally use makes it so much easier. It makes the life so much easier when you're making, um, you know, so many other life decisions that are overwhelming. Um, when you're shopping, it's important to think about, you know, how can I save at the grocery store? And I know a lot of people are shopping at more cost effective grocery stores. They're going to big box stores. We're getting things in bulk or buying in quantity. And that makes sense when you're doing a lot of those staple goods. Um, but, you know, buy what you need. A lot of times people buy in bulk and then they end up not using it. So it's really important to think about how you're going to use if you do buy in bulk. Maybe you're going to share with a friend or another family member just so that you don't waste what you're using. But when you go to the store, you know, think about the coupons. And, you know, many times everything is done virtually now or is done using an app. Every grocery store now has these loyalty reward programs that you can link into. And, you know, if you tend to not enjoy the technology side of those kinds of things, just, you know, go to customer service and they're there to help you uh, navigate, um, you know, to how to get the best deals when you're at the store. Because when you are a loyalty member, many times you can get a certain percentage off of your entire grocery bill. And that certainly can help. So think about some of those kinds of things. When you are shopping, I'm going to show you today, you know, it's important to look at different brands, um, you know, and also look at the store brands and also the generics. Many times the name brands will be cheaper than the store brand. And that's why it's so important to just take a few minutes and just glance at the shelf, no matter what you're buying. And make sure you're getting the best deal because, of course, you want to, you know, save money and, um, you know, be able to, to purchase more or better quality. Um, another option is, you know, buying food that's on sale. And this is one thing that sort of frustrates me. I'll have my list and I'll know what my budget is. And then when I get to the store, they have buy one, get one or you know, multiple things that I would typically buy, but I didn't need it on this grocery run. But many times they'll have pork tenderloin for $3.99 a pound, buy one, get one, or, um, you know, chicken breasts. And I definitely recommend buying those if you can, you know, include that on your budget, because you can always freeze those things up individually. Um, I'm cooking for two right now in my family. And I like to repackage things when I get home just so that I can, um, you know, have what I need and not freeze a whole big bulk of things and be forced to use it up. There's a lot of ways to look at this. 
So we're going to go ahead and get started. The first thing we're going to make today is our pineapple angel cake. And the one thing I've learned with this recipe is that you almost have to use uh, a name brand uh, of your angel food cake. And I haven't quite figured out why, because I've made it several times using an off brand and uh, it doesn't turn out quite as good. But I have my angel food cake mix in a bowl and I'm gonna add a can, which is a uh, 20 ounce can of, of crushed pineapple. And I'm gonna mix these two together and that is it. That is all there is for this recipe. So I'm just gonna make sure that I mix it up really good. And I'm gonna spray a 13 by nine inch cake pan. And I'm gonna pop this in the oven on 350 degrees for 25 to 35 minutes. We're gonna go ahead and check it after 25. Uh, many times, uh, depending on your oven and temperature controls and all that, you wanna be sure that you at least have your light on and can peek through the window. So what I'm doing here is just making sure that I have this all mixed together. And it sort of gets all foamy because of the interaction between the enzyme and the pineapple and, and the ingredients in the, the cake mix. So we're gonna have our 13 by nine inch pan. I'm gonna give it a good spray. And then I'm gonna take this cake mix that I just mixed up and just pour it in the pan. And pop that right in the oven. Easy peasy. There you go. So we're gonna pop it in the oven for 25 minutes. And this should be absolutely delicious. What I like to do with my angel cake is uh, when it first comes out of the oven, I like to let it cool off. And then you can either cut it in squares or you can scoop it out in little dessert dishes. And that's what we're gonna do a little bit later. But the nice thing is you can change it up. You can eat it plain if you want. If you want, you can add some uh, canned chunk peaches. These are, um, these are actually chunks. You can use slices. You can use fruit cocktail. The most important thing to remember, especially when someone is providing recipes, is realize that don't be a slave to those recipes. You know, use what you uh, have in your pantry, use what you love. Um, and by the way, I think uh, Katie has actually put the recipe handout in the chat box so that you can either follow along or take a look at that later. Um, another thing I like to do in the summertime, if I do have fresh berries, um, I can put that on there and then give it a little um, nice topping of either ready whip or cool whip. And also, um, you can do frozen. Frozen is also really, really good. I always keep the frozen fruit on hand um, because during the, the summertime, we have wonderful berries. You can find them in the winter, but they're definitely not as delicious and juicy and flavorful. So, um, you know, it's important to either, you know, uh, shop seasonally or buy everything frozen so that you can have it year round or better yet, buy it when the price is right in the summertime and freeze everything individually on like baking trays. What I like to do is take whole pieces of fruit like uh, strawberries or blueberries or raspberries, wash them really well, and then put them on a lined baking sheet and just set them in, a, in the freezer until they freeze individually. And then you can put them in a baggie or put them in a Ziploc container so that when you need them year round, you have delicious fruit that was um, more affordable than if you tried to buy during the winter. So um, anyway, that's all there is to this recipe. We're gonna go ahead and move along. And uh, I also, because we're talking about dining on a dime, I went ahead and just, went through my ingredients and kind of costed everything out for you, just so you know. A, uh, a serving of the pineapple cake, and depending on the serving size, obviously, would be about 25 cents a serving. If you use the whipped topping, it ends up being about 33 cents a serving. 
only because the whipped topping is actually the most uh, expensive item on that uh, ingredient list. Did Quick question. Yes. Um, how long can you keep the berries? Uh, in the freezer. Well, yeah. hopefully you don't. Hopefully you don't keep them too long because they're so delicious and call your name. But you could probably keep them for a good six months. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Make sure that you get all the air out of it. Um, you know, a lot of people have invested in some of those food storage systems. When you can get the air out so that you don't have freezer burns, you know, that's really the ideal. Many times I'll put them in a Ziploc bag, take the air out, zip it up, and then I'll put it in another bag, you know, just to double, uh, double proof it. But um, six months is probably a good, uh, a good amount of time. So um, when you're looking at the different ingredients for these recipes that we're doing today, I tried to get the uh, generic brands if it was a better price. Um, the cake mix was $3.44 and um, the Ready Whip um, ends up being about uh, almost $4, $3.50. So you can tell that um, you know, this would be something that if you were trying to cut costs, you can certainly leave this out and still enjoy a wonderful little dessert. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next one. And that is our, I call it a dump meal. And you'll get the, uh, you'll get the, the idea in a few minutes. Um, I'm using this electric burner today and it doesn't generate as much heat. So I kind of par cooked some of this ahead of time. This particular recipe is one of my husband's favorites. It is, uh, it's a taco soup actually. And I like to call it a dump dinner because all you do is open up cans and you dump, you dump. Um, today we're using beans and beans, I like to call it bean-tastic. You know, beans are these little, you know, wonderful um, nutritional uh, product that um, has a lot of nutrition, has protein, has a lot of fiber, has a lot of different nutrition, and it really is a plant forward food so that you don't need meat when you have beans in your, in your uh, meal. And in this particular meal, we're having onions, we're having beans and corn and hominy, but just to add a little bit of flavor, I am also using a little bit of lean ground meat. And you can see here, I've um, going to add some more to the mix. And we're also going to add some onion for wonderful flavor. And I chopped up a whole onion for this recipe. And the recipe calls for a pound of lean ground meat. You could also use ground turkey. You can totally leave it out. You know, whatever you want to do. Because when you're eating beans, you're getting a good quality protein. And you're also, it's its really a great budget meal and it stretches your meal because a little bit goes a long way with beans. Beans are, um, you know, just a, a wonderful thing to have in your pantry because it lasts a long time. And the nice thing now is that you'll notice when you go to buy beans or, or even tomato sauce and tomato paste and uh, chopped tomatoes, Many times it already comes seasoned, so then you don't have to even add a seasoning to it. I like to buy the fire roasted uh, tomatoes because it gives it a lot of good flavor from the fire roasting. When you purchase any of your beans, uh, you can certainly find the ones that have jalapenos in them and, and various spices and herbs. So that really makes it nice so that you don't even have to go and buy an extra spice or you don't have to go and buy a jalapeno from the produce section. It's all contained in that canned good. So after we get this cooked a little bit more, we'll go ahead and dump, do the dumping. But this recipe is one of our family favorites. You can see I have this nice big stock pot and um, the recipe calls for a can of uh, pinto beans, a can of hominy, a can of corn, and then also two cans or one large can of diced tomatoes. And then one 32 ounce container of uh, chicken broth. But you know, maybe you're one of those people that likes to make your own stock, which I did this week actually. I bought a rotisserie chicken, 
pulled all my chicken off of the bones. And then I actually put it in a stock pot with some water and added celery, some carrots and onions. And I cooked that down and it made a wonderful uh, chicken noodle soup this week. So, um, you know, maybe you're one of those people that really likes to be efficient that way and uh, don't have to use the store bought. But um, this particular recipe, you can stretch it by adding even two, two 32 ounce containers of the chicken broth. And that way it'll last you even longer. After we have our meal for the day, I generally put uh, the soup in um, like Ziploc containers and uh, usually do a serving um, you know, per container and then freeze them. So that when someone wants a nice little soup for lunch or maybe for dinner, we just pull out one or two containers. Another way to do it, if you're really short on space in your freezer, is let your soup cool down. Um, you know, and it's best to do that in the refrigerator. Let it cool down. Don't don't put it in the refrigerator hot, but cool it down, and then put it in Ziploc baggies again, and then you can lay them flat when you freeze them. I usually put them on the very bottom of my uh, freezer and that way they don't take up as much space as those little containers do. So there's a lot of little trips and tips and tricks. All right, this is cooking up pretty nicely. So we're gonna go ahead and start dumping. I'm gonna do my um, pinto beans. And if you don't like pinto beans, you know, feel free to use whatever bean you enjoy. And normally when I use my beans for other things, I'll rinse the, uh, the interior um, starchy water. But this is a dump recipe. So this is, we're just dumping everything in here. Now, some of you may be thinking, oh my gosh, well, what about all that sodium? Well, if you're really concerned about the sodium, and we probably all should be, you wanna look for products that have either no added salt, or canned goods that have um, that are considered low sodium. And many times you'll find those in the generic brands as well as the store brands. And those might come in handy for you if you're really, you know, watching your sodium intake. So think about, you know, when you're shopping to pick whatever is um, gonna be most, you know, efficient for you and most um, that fits into your health program. These are um, petite diced tomatoes in tomato juice. We're gonna dump that in there. And then also we have some, a different brand. And this one happens to be a low sodium brand. So we're just dumping all that in there. And then we're gonna add our chicken stock. And this one is a reduced sodium. So we're gonna add that to the mix. And uh, this, this particular recipe is absolutely wonderful. After we get all this in here and we get it to boil, we're gonna let it cook for just 15 or 20 minutes. And that's the beauty of this, it goes so fast. The other two ingredients in this recipe are ranch flavor dressing, just for some extra flavor. And then also to give it that kind of a taco flavor, is a, a taco seasoning. And this one is 30% less sodium, it's mild. Some people might like it hot. You can use whatever brand or whatever um, flavor you like. And uh, this just all gets stirred together in the pot. And then we're gonna let it cook for 15 or 20 minutes. And that is all there is to it. It is easy, it's simple, it's delicious. It's a very filling. And um, family loves it. My family absolutely loves it. And for people who are just learning how to cook, you know, it's such an easy thing. Uh, probably the hardest part is really just opening up all the cans. But uh, we, we have some in the freezer at all times because it makes such a quick and easy, very hearty, um, you know, meal. And, and it could even be a snack, actually, um, especially during these days where, you know, the temperatures drop and it's, uh, you need something that really kind of warms you up from the inside out. So um, that's all we have for the um, Make Ahead taco soup. And I did a little rundown of the, the pricing here, and it ends up being a dollar a serving. So this makes quite a bit. 
And, um, you know, I got all the canned goods for most of them were less than a dollar. Some were 78 cents. Um, the most expensive thing on these uh, on this recipe, of course, is going to be your ground beef or ground turkey. And again, depending on the kind that you buy, um, you can buy 93.7. And that means that uh, by weight, there's 7% fat. Then there's also uh, 80-20, which you have 20% by weight fat. And a lot of people, because of the budget, might go for that route. If you do, you might want to get um, a paper towel and just kind of you know, whisk it around after you fry up your meat to absorb some of the fat. The only other option is to pour that in a, um, like a colander and rinse it under uh, water so you can get some of the fat out. It really is up to you, but if you're really looking to maybe lower some of your saturated fat, you might wanna think about the, the, the lean ground beef or the ground turkey, but again, realize the turkey isn't always the best option because if it doesn't tell you the percentage of fat, you may be getting a high fat ground turkey. So think about that. But when I looked at the pricing, the 97.3 uh, ground beef was $5.67 a pound. The 80.20 was $4.78 a pound. And believe it or not, the turkey was um, $6.14. So think about all those things, you know, ahead of time, you know, what you think might be the best option when you get to the store, it might not be. So, you know, depending on what your health goals are, depending on what your budget is, you know, you, it can really make a difference. And uh, for a dollar a serving for um, a meal, and you might want to have it with some crackers or maybe a half of a sandwich or a toasted cheese sandwich, um, you know, that, that, you know, makes the meal complete. Um, uh, many times what I like to do is have a cup of soup and a small green salad. And that way, you know, I'm adding some extra vegetables. And, uh, that also reminds me that this soup, again, you don't have to follow the recipe. You can add so much more to this. If you have leftover fresh spinach from a salad that you've used, or Maybe you have some frozen spinach or kale in your freezer. You can certainly throw that in here. Think of it as an opportunity to add nutrition. You know, especially when it comes to vegetables, you can never have too much. And if I add more veggies to this mix and it ends up getting, you know, too thick, I might add another uh, cont big container of my chicken broth. So, you know, it, it can, you can stretch it to feed an army. And that's the beautiful thing about this soup. All right. So this is looking really good. It's not quite done, but we are going to pretend because we're on Cook TV. Uh, I'm going to show you how wonderful it looks served up and just how hearty it is. I don't know if you can see that, but... Um, you know, it has a lot of really, really delicious flavor. And um, you can even top that with some fresh herbs if you want, or maybe even top it with a little bit of Parmesan cheese. But, um, you know, anything that you do to this is going to make it even better. It is a delicious recipe, and I, I hope your family loves it. So that is our dump dinner, our taco soup. And we're going to move on to the next recipe. Any questions? Whoops, got real slippery down there. Any questions? I'm not seeing any so far. Okay, sounds good. Our next one is kind of fun. A lot of people get intimidated when they go to the produce section of the grocery store, but in the winter, it's really fun because you end up having more winter squash as opposed to summer squash, like your crooked neck, your zucchini, those have so much water content. They, they really go bad quicker. And they also, so you have to use them up when you bring them home. And, um, you know, many times they, because they have such a high water content, they don't have as much flavor. So I always look forward to the fall when the, you know, produce section changes. 
And uh, I always look forward to getting uh, spaghetti squash. This is what it looks like. Um, it comes usually this, this uh, shape, but many times they're a lot bigger. I tried to find the smallest one that I could find just to make this um, go quicker when I'm cooking it. But this particular squash is really fun. It's hard, which means I can buy it and I could probably store it for a good two to three months and it's not going to go bad. And um, it is, it's very hearty. The flavors are delicious. When you open this up, it ends up looking like any other squash where winter squash, like pumpkin that has seeds in it and it has some, you know, threads in it. So when I uh, cut this open, I usually clean all that out, but I wanted to show you many times it's a little intimidating because we're not really sure, you know, what to do with this. And if you don't have a lot of strength or if you don't have a really good sharp knife, it's, it's very intimidating to actually cut this open. So I wanted to show you what I do. I take my knife and I give it, you know, several cuts and I'm gonna show you, I pop it in the microwave for about three minutes. And it's going to make it so much easier to cut. I'll show you. So that's a really, really good trick when you have acorn squash, spaghetti squash, any of those butternut squash that are so intimidating. Um, I have never seen this in the freezer department. But I have seen butternut squash, which is also really good and hearty and very, you know, you know, uh, stuffed with nutrition. Uh, because anytime it's darker color, anytime there's not a lot of water, it's going to be so much more nutrient dense. So, um, you know, it's it's definitely something to buy, and they're very affordable when you think about comparing that to some of the other produce in the in the produce section. But what it does is it offers a lot of nutrition, but it also offers intense flavor. And there's many ways that you can process or cook it. Um, you can actually microwave, cut it in half and microwave the whole thing. And it doesn't take much time to do that. It takes less time. But if you're looking for uh, making squash that has a lot more intense flavor, I like to cut it in half, drizzle a little bit of oil over the top, and then pop it in an oven that's at least 400. You can do anything up to 425. And obviously, the higher the temperature, the less time it's going to take to cook. So I quick, put the, Cindy, quick question yes. on the squash. Um, yes. How can you store it and how long? You can store it in your pantry. You want to store it, you know, where you would store your potatoes. Um, I store it in the pantry and you can store it up to three months. Okay. And that's really, you know, makes it so nice because you like, unlike most produce, it's going to go bad quick, but yep. your winter squash is going to last. Great. Thank you. Uh-huh. So you can see, I, I baked these already. I roasted these in the oven yesterday. So what you do is you cut it, which I'll show you in a minute, and you take your oil and you drizzle it over the top. Well, first of all, you kind of clean out some of the threads, clean out the, uh, the seeds, drizzle a little bit of oil. And then what you do is I turn them upside down because I wanna get a good, uh, like a crust almost. It's not really a crust, but it just really gives you so much flavor when you roast anything on a high oven. So that's what it looks like when it comes out of the oven. I'm gonna show you what it looks like when it comes out of the microwave. We have about 30 seconds. You wanna start with a good sharp knife. And I always recommend if you can, um, you know, get your knife sharpened. You know, many grocery stores actually will do that. They have a service where they'll have a, um, a knife sharpener come to the meat department once a month, pick up your knives. Um, I actually have a guy that um, has a mobile unit and comes to different neighborhoods and he'll come and sharpen them. But when you're cooking, you want a sharp knife because you can really get cut or injured if you have a knife that's it's that's dull. But anyway, let's look at this. Let's look at this uh, squash when it comes out of the microwave. It still feels firm, but when I stick my knife in it, it's so much softer than if I tried to uh, cut it 
before I microwaved it. So you still have to use a little bit of pressure, but it makes it so, so much easier to cut. Okay, there you go. So you can see the seeds in here and you can see the difference in color. It started out the same way. So anytime you roast anything and get that uh, wonderful caramelization is what it's called, um, it really adds to the flavor of the meal. So this, I'll process this a little bit later, but I wanted to show you just how much easier it is to cut when you pop it in the microwave for just a few minutes. So what we're gonna do is take this spaghetti squash and we're gonna make a dinner bowl out of it. And I love these because you can do so much, so many different flavors. So for instance, I have right here, I have some chicken that was uh, left over from a rotisserie chicken. And I have some enchilada sauce and I have some leftover veggies. So I'm gonna utilize that and make like a chicken enchilada bowl. So you can see when you actually um, rake your fork through this vegetable that it ends up getting like spaghetti and that's why it's called spaghetti squash. So it starts out like any other squash, but then when you bake it, it really has the same consistency as spaghetti. And the beautiful thing about this, especially if you are maybe um, a person with diabetes and trying to cut your carbohydrates or anyone for that matter who wanted to cut their carbs, this is so much more um, nutritious and also low calorie compared to if you had uh, actual spaghetti because of that, that would be so much starchier. This is not really starchy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little bit of enchilada sauce. And I think the recipe calls for red enchilada sauce. Use what you have. I happen to have some green in my pantry. So I'm gonna add a little bit of that. And then I'm going to add some of the shredded chicken. And I think our dessert is calling us. I'm going to add some vegetables. And I actually have some broccoli and carrots here. Okay, let's check on that. Let's check on that cake for a minute. So I have this in for 25 minutes and it's pretty much done. We're gonna let it cool off in a minute, but doesn't that look delicious? I certainly wish you could smell it. It is, ah, uh, it's a combination of like a vanilla pineapple flavor. So we're gonna let that cool off a minute. But getting back to this bowl, I like to just mix up all these ingredients and there's so many things you can do here. If you wanted, you can add, you could have saved some of the taco sauce or taco uh, seasoning from the soup and added that to the mix instead of adding the uh, enchilada sauce. You can take, maybe you have some chips and salsa that you have as a snack. Put some of your favorite salsa in here. I like to get the ones that have the uh, chunky tomatoes and, and maybe some beans in there. Some of them have corn. You can mix that up. And then on top, we're gonna to add some cheese. And um, you can have, there's so many different options out there, but um, when I go to the grocery store, I just kind of scan to see which ones have the better prices. And uh, I like to get either a sharp cheddar or a mixy mix, which has some Monterey Jack in it. This one is just a sharp cheese. This one's actually a little, it's called reduced fat. I like to add a little bit of that on top. And then you can pop that in the oven. And uh, this is enough for a meal for one person. And it is delicious. And then I take the other one and then maybe whoever I'm eating with doesn't really want the enchilada flavor. Maybe they're in the mood for lasagna. So what I would do is get some spaghetti sauce, like a really good jar of spaghetti sauce, mix that in with, you can put some mozzarella cheese, you can add ricotta. 
Um, if you wanted, you could even add some of the fried up ground meat and put that in there uh, to make a really nice hearty lasagna. And then maybe you are just using this as a side dish and you have a nice piece of grilled something to go along with it. You can even just toss this with a little bit of lemon juice, uh, some Parmesan cheese, maybe even some lemon zest to add a little bit of extra flavor. So there's so many things that you can do with this uh, bowl. So because we're not really going to eat this right now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to put it in the oven. But after I process these and add to it whatever I want, I'm going to pop them in the oven for probably, you know, if these were hot, I probably only need to give it maybe 10 minutes, you know, because everything is already cooked. You're just heating it and melting the cheese. Um, I, since I cooked these last evening, they are actually cold. So I might have to keep those in the refrigerator or excuse me, in the oven a little bit longer. But if I wanted, I can also put these on a plate and pop them in the microwave. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Let's put it in there. And you'll see how the melted cheese goodness looks. But it's a it's a wonderful way to um, utilize, you know, a good hearty vegetable, especially if you've had it in there for a month or two. You're not running to the store to get it. Everything else that I'm using is actually a staple in my pantry, and um, and you can for different flavor profiles and please everybody that you're cooking for, which is, you know, sometimes the biggest task when you're cooking is just trying to please different palates. So um, it's, it's really an easy way to go. And it's um, something that not a lot of people think about. And if you want more ideas, I highly recommend just going to the, um, to the internet and just Google um, spaghetti squash bowls and you'll probably find a lot of different ideas. But the thing to remember is always choose flavors and um, ideas, things that you like. So maybe you have some chorizo that you've used for like scrambling eggs in the morning, or maybe you put chorizo in your chili. Add a little bit of chorizo in there. If you are thinking health conscious, if you're thinking health conscious, you know, think about using low fat meats, um, or maybe you wanna keep it vegetarian and not have the meat in there at all or the, or the protein in there at all. Maybe add some beans to this mix. You could take a handful of the beans that you used in your soup and mix those up in here with your melted cheese and it's, it would be wonderful. So again, like I always say, you know, don't be a slave to the recipe, just, you know, utilize the things that you have. And that means that you want to shop your pantry. You always shop your pantry before you go to the store, shop your pantry before you go to, um, you know, cooking in the kitchen. I keep a lot of different seasonings, spices. <clears throat> and nowadays, there are so many blends that you can get uh, like, for instance, one of my favorite is a McCormick's uh, jerk seasoning, and uh, you can mix that in there with your chicken and other veggies and really give it kind of a Caribbean flavor that has a sweet, hot kind of sensation. And um, again, it just it makes the same recipe so different every time you make it so that if you made it every week, you can certainly not get tired of it because you're varying up the flavors. So anyway, that is all we have for that recipe. And you can see here how little um, dishes that were used to make this item and how quick it is. And you'll notice that when I do these cooking demos, I have everything out. And that is what we call mise en place. It's sort of a chefy term for getting everything organized. So when I do these cooking demos, I have my little trays and I put everything I need on the tray, whether it's a utensil or an ingredient that's a staple. 
all the refrigerated things go in the oven, or excuse me, go in the ref, um, in the refrigerator, and then I'll pull those out at the last minute, whether it's the cheese or the eggs or you know the frozen goods. But if you have everything organized, it makes life so much easier in the kitchen, and that is such a big part of you know cooking. I think a lot of times people don't want to do it and don't take the time because they're just not organized. So when you have your list and you have your recipe ideas, you know, get everything organized so that when, you know, it comes time to cook, it's a, it's a flash. Um, you can also do a lot of pre-prepping ahead. Uh, like when you're finishing the dishes or finishing cooking from last night's meal, maybe you're beginning prepping for the next day. And I know it um, sounds easy for me to say because I enjoy it so much, but really and truly, if you get into the habit of doing that, it just makes life so much easier and you can save money, you know, stick to your budget and then also really enjoy the flavors of maybe new things that you've, uh, you know, haven't tried before. That's why I love doing these demos because I think people more than anything need to know a few skills. They need to you know, understand nutrition better, but I think most people just need ideas and uh, that's what I'm here for. So on my handout, I have my email and I have my phone number. If anybody has any questions that I can help with, uh, I'm certainly willing to do that. Also, if you have questions that I cannot answer, I certainly have uh, a lot of resources and a lot of fellow colleagues that have specialties in all different areas of nutrition. So we're gonna get going here on our next recipe. This one, funny enough, is, um, I got the idea from TikTok and I'm not a big TikToker, but one of the rages on TikTok nowadays is actually what we call dollar store dinners. And if you haven't heard about dollar store dinners, you need to get on the bandwagon because it is really, really fun. Everything that you use for this meal can be found at a dollar store, no matter what brand it is. Now, mind you, every store has different ingredients, different things that they sell. Some have a freezer department, some don't. But this is called uh, Dollar Store Dining. And I decided to do a stir fry because I think it's just so quick and easy. And you can, again, utilize leftovers. You can utilize a lot of ingredients that you already have. And you have all the food groups in your, uh, in your actual meal. So I'm going to let this skillet heat up a little bit. It's going to take a minute. And what I decided to do today was a stir fry using uh, several things. You can use the leftover ground meat from your soup. You can use the leftover rotisserie chicken from this, uh, the enchilada dish that you made. Or you can have some ground pork in here. You can use, um, if you have a, a piece of beef, chop that up real fine. Whatever it is you have, use it. And what I always say is stir fry is the best because when you're making a stir fry, you don't feel cheated when you see a small piece of meat on your plate because it's cut up into small chunks. If somebody fed you a three ounce piece of meat, three, three, three to four ounces, the size of the palm of your hand, which is all we need, some people kind of feel cheated. But if you take that three ounce piece of chicken or meat or even seafood and stir fry it with a whole lot of colorful vegetables and then add either some noodles or maybe you wanna have it on a bed of whole grain rice or whole grains of any kind, you know, all of a sudden you have this whole hearty meal and you don't feel cheated because you didn't have a big piece of meat. So I love it. I think it's a really good way to cook. I, I did save up some chicken and because it's already cooked, I don't have to worry about, um, you know, cooking it. If it was raw, I'd have to make sure that I cooked it a little longer. But what, I, what I'm going to do right now is just make sure that it's heated through. So I'm going to add my oil. And you can see that I use these little squeeze bottles 
I put all my oil, whether it's um, canola or, you know, uh, sunflower oil, soybean, whatever I have, I put them in these containers. It's so much easier to kind of just swizzle it around as opposed to starting from a big jar and, or a big bottle and dumping it in, you end up getting too much. So I'm gonna make sure that my oil is heated pretty well. Now, if you have a wok, that's even better because a wok comes up on the sides. So what I like to do is heat up my oil really, really good and hot, put in my raw ingredients. And then after you cook them, you just slide them up the side and then add the next ingredients. And I like to start with my protein, but because the protein is actually already cooked, I'm gonna start with my veggies today. And what I did was I got a store brand of Asian style vegetables. And this is a combination of broccoli, onions, there's some uh, water chestnuts, some carrots, and also um, some sugar snap peas. So we're gonna go ahead and add those to the mix. And you can hear that nice little sizzle. And again, because I just got those out of the freezer, they may take a little bit longer to cook. But isn't that nice that I don't have to go and get all these individual ingredients process them, you know, make sure that um, I use them up in sufficient time so they don't go bad. This is all, you know, in a bag and it's frozen and it, it will last in there for several months and I can use it when I need it and use it for different things. Okay, so I'm going to stir fry that a bit and then after I get that cooked, I'm going to add some of the chicken. And for this meal, instead of using rice, which I love to use rice with my stir fry, I thought because it was a dollar store, I would go ahead and get some of the um, ramen noodles. And I cook those ahead of time in a little bit of boiling water. So I'm gonna add those to the mix. Now, if you want seasoning to go in here, obviously you want a little flavor. Maybe you want some Asian flavoring. You can add um, the little packet from the mix. Now, mind you, it's going to be higher in sodium. The uh, vegetables are very low in sodium because they're processed just uh, fresh picked and frozen. They don't have any uh, preservative in them. But if you wanted to use this packet, it's a chicken flavored packet and it has some spice in it. This is called picante chicken flavor. You can certainly add that to the mix and that'll give you some flavor that you want. Or better yet, at the dollar store, you can find some of these prepackaged um, mixes or uh, prepackaged sauces. This one is a Kung Pao and I'm gonna go ahead and add that to the skillet and mix that up. And that way, I'm certainly going to add a lot of flavor. And look at that. It is easy as you can get. It's colorful because of all the veggies. And this will feed at least two people, maybe even three. So if you didn't want the Kung Pao flavor, which is a little bit spicier, you can do a peanut sauce. There's so many different flavors that you can go with. Or if you wanted just a splash of soy sauce or maybe some teriyaki that you might have in your refrigerator. You know, many times we buy products for a recipe and then they end up in your refrigerator. Well, again, know what's in there and utilize that instead of, you know, trying to buy new ingredients or in trying to, instead of, um, you know, going without flavor, because you never want to do that. When you're, especially when you're trying to eat a little healthier, you want to get as much flavor as possible. Now, for those of you that are concerned about the sodium, these are higher in sodium. So maybe you wanna use less of it. Or the other thing to remember is if you have a higher sodium meal, maybe make sure the rest of the day that your intake of sodium is lower. You know, that is another way to manage you know, how you, um, you know, deal with sodium. Because anytime you're using anything that's processed or highly processed, you're going to get more sodium. 
But like I mentioned, the uh, fresh frozen veggies are going to be no sodium at all. Um, this says in a one cup, or actually a four cup serving is only 30 milligrams. So there's really very, very little sodium as opposed to the, the ramen noodle packet that if you use the actual packet, you're getting um, 640 milligrams. So you can see what a big difference. And if you're really trying to follow um, the healthy guidelines, you want no more than 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams a day. And that's only the, that's the equivalent of a teaspoon. So anyway, that is what we have for our meal. And uh, I'm gonna plate that up for you just so you can see what it looks like on the plate. It's absolutely smelling delicious in here. It's 11 o'clock and it smells like dinner time. But I love all these wonderful veggies. Look at that, yummo. So that would be a really nice serving for anyone to enjoy. So there's our dollar store dinner. Now think about all the other things that you might find at the dollar store. You might find some case, uh, some tortillas, or maybe, um, you know, they have many times they'll have the, the taco shells. Think about using some of those for a meal. So if you happen to go in there, I wrote down some ideas like a, a quesadilla using some of the beans that were in my soup, or maybe add some, um, a packet of some Spanish rice. You know, many times they have these little packets of rice that you can purchase for anywhere from a dollar to $2 a packet. And instead of taking the time to cook rice from scratch or even a whole grain, which could be quinoa, farro, or a mixture of all the different ones, Instead of taking the time to cook those for anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on the, the type you buy, you take these little packets that are no bigger than this, pop them in the microwave for 90 seconds and boom, you're done. And uh, I started doing that quite a bit. I buy the packets when they're on sale, have you know the jasmine rice, the basmati, I'll buy the whole grains, the whole grain mixture, and uh, I might put more effort into maybe grilling a piece of salmon. Uh, and then I have my quick and easy rice to go with. And you can get dinner done in a snap, you know, again, if you plan for that. So that's why it's so important to really, you know, build your pantry. And when I say pantry, I also mean, think about the types of things that you have in your refrigerator and use things up. You know, if I have leftover anything, I'm going to use it in a way for the next meal or the next day that's really going to save me time, but it's still going to be flavors that I love. I made um, a dirty rice the other day with um, some lean ground meat uh, made in into the uh, dirty rice, and I used that several different ways this week, and um, you know, it, it, it just saves so much time, and it really is delicious, but it doesn't feel like the same idea that I used the night before. So like, like this dish here, you have your veggies as a side dish, and then the next day it'll be a whole meal with a different flavor component. Your beans, leftover beans, you can have soup, but then maybe you're gonna use some beans in your salad as a cold salad. You know, you're gonna take the leftover veggies and turn it into um, a spaghetti squash dish. And it doesn't taste like that side of veggies that you had three nights ago. So anyway, whatever, whatever, it'll, whatever you have to do to make it quick, easy, and, um, and it's also going to be affordable. So last but not least, we're going to do one more. And this recipe is actually, um, could be breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It's called Italian frittatas, and I like to do make your own frittatas. So we're gonna heat up this skillet. Actually, yes, you wanna get it good and hot. So a frittata, you know, say ta-ta 
to things that take a lot of time and say hello to something like a frittata where you can use you know, some of these other ingredients, and you're also going to have a complete meal because you're going to have eggs as your protein. You're going to have your veggies. You can even use uh, chunks of dried up bread that, that maybe you're, is still good, but you just don't want to eat it because it's dry. Or maybe you want to have a spaghetti frittata where you can put some noodles in there. Honestly, you cannot go wrong. It's a very forgiving recipe, just like everything else we've made today, very forgiving. So what we're gonna do is take our eggs. And I would say, um, you know, it's, it's hard to do an omelet or, to, or excuse me, a frittata with less than six eggs. And um, so what you wanna do is um, make it, and if you don't eat it all, just store it in the refrigerator and then maybe you can have it the next day. You can use leftovers to make a frittata and you can use your frittata as a leftover. How about that? Okay, so I have my six eggs. And there we go. And you know, I, I used eggs today because they're always so affordable, but as we all probably have realized, they've gone up in price. And funny enough, the more expensive brand typically has uh, recently been the, the least expensive brand, which is kind of hard to understand. But anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just give these a little stir to blend it all together. So I'm whisking these together. And then I'm gonna add whatever I want to it. And the recipe that you have is make your own frittata. So you can add as little or as much as you want. I always tend to add a lot. I'm gonna utilize these veggies just because we have them handy. In fact, I might wanna cut them up a little bit. I have the broccoli here that has um, some bigger heads, some bigger pieces. So I'm gonna just chop those up. And I'm going to use them just because I have them here. So I have broccoli, I have carrots. Mix that in. And then I brought out some cayenne pepper just because we like a little bit of seasoning. And you can add a little bit of cayenne and it's not really going to be hot. It's just going to add flavor. And you can also add anything else you have in your refrigerator. I happen to have some chopped up ham that was left over from, you know, some sandwiches. And because I have some spinach, I'm gonna add the spinach as well. So you can see how big you can build this. Just give it a good stir. Make sure your skillet is good and hot. And you do want to add some oil, but you want to use a nonstick skillet when you can, because it's important to, to make sure that the eggs don't stick. Then I'm going to pop this right in my hot skillet. You can hear how hot that was. And I'm going to let that cook. And the trick to making an omelet is you want to constantly be lifting up the sides and letting the liquid part go underneath because it's gonna start coagulating. It's gonna start congealing. And you wanna be sure that you get, you know, some of the, the looser parts done. The ends are always gonna start, um, cooking quicker. You can see how nice and green that is, a dietitian's dream. So I'm gonna lift up and I'm gonna move the liquid underneath, okay? And there's a lot of different schools of thought. You can certainly cook this whole thing in the skillet. Um, a lot of times people will partially cook it and then pop it in the oven. Uh, if you have a small oven, that's fine, but I, if, and if you have the oven on already, it's fine. But if I have to heat up the oven just to 
just to finish something off for five or less minutes, it doesn't seem fair to use up all that energy. So what you can do is, you know, just kind of moosh this around a little bit and then you can put a lid on it until the parts that are still liquid congeal. Okay. Now, I always like to add a little bit of extra seasoning, like maybe some bread cracked pepper, because we love pepper. I'm gonna add just a hint of salt. I had some ham in there, so I don't really even need the salt. And then on top, I'm gonna add some of my cheese. And you have all the food groups. I have my protein, I have my veggies, uh, I have my uh, eggs as a protein source. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of dairy on top. And this is a wonderful meal and a wonderful snack. So what you can do is you can actually take it, I'm gonna get a lid and put that on top. You can um, eat this for your meal, save your leftovers in a container. You can have this as a snack, which would be a really awesome snack because anytime you have a snack, you wanna have a little bit of protein with it. And this is chock full of protein. Um, you can, you can uh, cut this up, put it in a um, corn tortilla, make a, an egg quesadilla out of it. Um, what else? You can um, put it in a soft tortilla and make a wrap sandwich out of it, like a huevos rancheros with a little bit of salsa. There's so many things that you can do. And whenever I, um, whenever I have time, I usually just write down an idea. And then I always put multiple variations. Because again, you don't have to think out of the box every week for your meal times. You can just go ahead and enjoy the same things that you were having, but just change up the flavors or change up how you're using those ingredients. I'm gonna give this just a couple of minutes. I'm just trying to be sure that the bottom is not overcooked, but I wanna be sure that the top and the middle are cooked. And this is looking so delicious. And then if you wanted, you could serve this with some whole grain bread, uh, a whole grain English muffin, you know, just to kind of round out a little bit. If you wanted, um, you could actually put a whole grain in it, or like I mentioned, the noodles. There's just so many things, or, or maybe you have that cubed bread that's kind of dried and it doesn't taste good to eat it as a sandwich. So maybe you want to put that in there. And uh, it's it's one way to just add nutrition. So don't think of it as oh, adding all these calories. Think of it as nutrition by addition. What can I add to this dish that's going to make it more nutritious, more filling, feed an army, uh, be cost effective, you know, all those things together. Because uh, when it comes to frugal cooking, there's a little saying and it's, it is use it up, wear it out, make do or do without. And that's really the name of the game when it comes to frugal cooking. So um, this is, I guess the cheese is taking just a little bit longer than I thought. All right. So we've made all these recipes. I wish you were here to sample some of them with me. I'm going to show you what this cake looks like. It's absolutely smelling wonderful. And we're going to take our little dish and scoop out a big piece. Let's see if I have a spoon here. So you can cut it up, but it's actually just better if you just scoop it out, put it in a little dish. And you can kind of see, um, it's, it looks like angel, angel food cake, but it has wonderful pineapple in it. And I typically use the pineapple in its own juice so that I'm not adding extra sugar. And this would actually even work for someone who had diabetes. You know, you want to have a small piece. And then, of course, I want to add my peaches because I had some canned peaches in my pantry. But otherwise, you know, I might have anything else, like I said, berries or bananas. If you had uh, the angel cake with the pineapple and add some bananas, you could even do a little drizzle of chocolate sauce and have like a 
banana split, you know, really delicious. And then to kind of make this a little bit more special, which you certainly don't have to, is add that little bit of ready whip on top and you have a really luscious, delicious dessert. And uh, it's not really expensive and it really kind of goes a long way with, um, you know, feeding a lot of people. I'm actually going to a, an event tomorrow. So that's where this is going. Here's my wonderful frittata. It's all the cheese is all done. I'm gonna show you underneath how golden it looks. If you can see that. And uh, it's, it's perfectly done. And I'm gonna put that on a plate too. To show you how how it looks plated up because I think that is also very, very important. And this uh, frittata for six eggs with all these vegetables will probably feed at least four people. Well, probably four people, not at least. Oops. There we go. And you can serve that with some fresh tomatoes if you had them, or, um, you know, like I mentioned, some whole grain bread. And that would make a delicious meal. It would make a good breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So anyway, thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with me. Um, I, I'm here to answer questions, know that I can be a resource to you. And I want to thank our sponsor, Senior Source, for having me. It's uh, It's been a lovely day. And you know, I hope you got a lot out of it and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. I certainly did. I'll be coming over soon to help you eat all that food. I hate to see it go to waste. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. There's just one, uh, so far, one general question. If maybe you have suggestions for finding low carb recipes. Low carb. So for instance, if you were doing this uh, frittata, that would be absolutely low carb because you have your eggs that are, that's a protein, your veggies, which are very low carb, low calorie carbs, and, um, and the cheese doesn't have any carbohydrate in it. So that would be definitely low carb. Um, you know, your spaghetti squash is a lower starch vegetable. So that would be low carb. Um, and I have the cheese in there, the vegetables and protein in there. So that would be low carb. The only thing that's not low carb would be your uh, stir fry. And what you can do is, um, you know, just stir fry all your veggies and meat if you wanted it, leave out the noodles and rice. And I highly recommend that all the time because stir fry is so easy. And um, that's probably the, that's probably it. On this on this particular uh, class. Okay, great, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say a couple things to those that are still on. Um, when we close out the meeting, there will be a survey that pops up on your screen. Please take a minute to complete that for us so that we can continue to bring you these great programs. And also, uh, Cindy has generously offered to uh, award one of you lucky people with one of her books. Um, so we're gonna do a. Wheel of Fortune to see who's the winner. Donna wins the book. Congratulations to Donna. Um, and I will make sure Cindy gets your, um, your contact info so you guys can coordinate that. All right. Kimberly, anything else? No, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your Saturday. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.